so let me move on now to the, uh, to the talk. Uh, so the first talk is by Professor Noons, and uh, he is going to tell us about uh, high temperature supernova. So good morning, everybody. Uh, I should first of all like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to come here and see this wonderful campus that you've built uh, and all these very smart people. I'm an industrial scientist, so please don't expect me to come up to your standards. Uh, so I'm extremely sorry to hear that TVR is unwell. Uh, he was an important teacher for me in my early career when I was working on uh, the large N problem with Nick Reed and Alex Hewson. So today, I'm not going to be uh, exposing to you some elegant field theory, um, but I'm hoping to uh, point the direction in which uh, such a field theory, I believe, can be found. Uh, and in doing this, uh, I shall be using just uh, standard methods, uh, mean field and R RPA, although applying them in a slightly uh, new way. What's happening? Oh, it's not on the screen. Okay, it is now. Uh, so this is our lab, the uh, IBM TJ Watson Research Center, uh, which I'm afraid does very little uh, pure research these days, like, like all the other industrial labs, incidentally. So just a word or two introducing the concept of superconductivity. So in a way, the foundations of all this lie with Landau's uh, deep insight into the electron gas. Um, and I can remember actually having a big argument with one of the professors at Imperial, where I was a PhD student over this. He hadn't heard of it. Uh, so the idea is that... Uh, the quasi-particles in the Fermi C of a metal are long-lived. They don't scatter very much because phase space prevents them from scattering. If this electron goes across here, there's only a very small number of counter-electrons that are available to take away its energy and momentum. And uh, that means the quasi-particles are nearly non-interactive. Um, however, there is, uh, in many cases, a attractive interaction between electrons, usually mediated by uh, phonons, that is vibrations. And this leads to them pairing up into Cooper pairs. Uh, typically, they are of opposite spin and opposite momentum, forming a Lomovitz Cooper pair. The Cooper pairs are bosons, and they condense into a superfluid. Uh, at a certain temperature, the critical temperature. But uh, when they do this, uh, the pairs themselves form. So unlike, unlike what is called a, a 2D Beck, these are, uh, this is a sort of collective process where the pairs form at the same temperature as the condensate forms. Uh, so because there's a condensate, uh, the current in the superconductor uh, is able to uh, flow without scattering. And the formation of the condensate leads to an energy gap in the single particle spectrum. Now, uh, at IBM Zurich, um, there was discovered in 1986 uh, these high temperature superconductors. This is uh, transition temperature of superconductors starting with uh, Kamaling Onis way back in 1904. And you've seen a rise in transition temperature. And then suddenly in 86, there is a phase transition 
as this new class of superconductors, the high temperature superconductors, was invented and explored. The highest temperature being about 140. Uh, and more recently, there was discovered uh, under very, very high pressure, uh, 200 GPA, that's a hideous pressure, um, H3S uh, has a transition temperature uh, way up here, 200. Um, and actually, these seem to be very slightly related. I'll touch on this issue. Um, so, since that date, 1986, there's been a great deal of uh, theoretical and experimental work on the mechanism, which still is not uh, fully understood. So this is where I take a pause before daring to mention that I'm not going to have a purely electronic theory. Whoops. Why not? Because the data leads us elsewhere. So what are these uh, high temperature superconducting materials? Oops. Uh, they're quasi 2D metallic superconductors. Here's a typical structure. You see all kinds of uh, half octahedra and various kinds of things here and things there. But the action is in these uh, planes of copper and oxygen. Uh, and there are 23 types of this superconductor. And they all have these planes. And in all cases, the planes are where the action is. So we can basically model the problem by considering principally these planes. And these planes uh, consist of a simple square lattice of copper with oxygen in the bond. And this is called the perovskite bond. There's a class of uh, uh, materials, very wide class, including ferroelectrics and all kinds of stuff. More recently, uh, they have been considered the solar cells. And uh, they have uh, a metal called a B atom, uh, which in this case is copper, with uh, typically oxygen in the bond. Can't be something else. So this perovskite bond is the universal, universal building block in the perovskites. Uh, now the low temperature state of this uh, quasi-metallic uh, quasi 2D metallic superconductor, uh, if you make it normal with a magnetic field, uh, uh, is, indeed, is indeed a Fermi liquid, uh, because it has a de Haas van Alten Fermi surface, which is the classic, uh, well, in my opinion, the classic test, because uh, when I was in Chicago many, many decades ago, everybody was extremely excited about this uh, new type of experiment revealed the details of the Fermi surface. So, you know, you always think this must be great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Mott transition of these systems and uh, where that fits into the picture. Uh, so, uh, so these systems uh, are doped by varying uh, some uh, concentration of some element. Um, and the whole dope so this is typically 6, 9, 12, 15, 18%. Those are the kinds of doping uh, that you can produce by changing you know, strontium to lanthanum ratio or you know, adding oxygen or whatever. Um, so let me say that these materials have been explored very thoroughly. So the material science, the crystallography and so on has been perfected, uh, which was not the case in the first decade of their existence. Um, so what we're looking at here is Cambridge uh, de Haasman Alpha data, and you're looking here at the affected mass. This is a Mott transition. On the underdoped side of Mott transition, you have some sort of you know, magnetic system. And here the carrier mass, sorry, one over the carrier, the carrier velocity is increasing extremely rapidly as we go away from the Mott transition, as we dope it. 
So it's, it's rapidly becoming a, a good metric, a fairly good metric. Uh, here is some other data uh, from France involving a study of a, a rather strange spin correlation, which seems to be important. And the form factor for this uh, has dropped down as you increase the dome and sort of dies, I mean, apart from these pretty rainbows. The actual data has pretty much died by this dashed line. So um, on the left side of this dashed line, you have the sort of uh, insulating type modules, such as magnetism. On the right-hand side of this line, you have most of the superconducting phase lines. Uh, this is different material. Um, and you have a thing called the pseudo gap, which I'll talk about a lot more. So this is the edge of the pseudo gap. This is the pseudo gap phase diagram. And this overlaps TBR's talk, because actually what he was talking about was the measurement that made these points, which is the Nernst ratio. So he was actually going to go, and I think he will go in later in the week, to actually what uh, is the fundamental uh, physics behind uh, this uh, Nernst effect. But all I'm going to uh, quote here is the fact that using this uh, Nernst effect, uh, the experimentalist uh, was able to um, detect a symmetry difference across this phase line. And I think this explains what this phase actually means. It's a uh, change in local symmetry, uh, which in this particular material becomes a change in global symmetry because of its structure. Okay. Um, so, um, so on this side, we have pseudo gap and superconductivity, which I think is mainly associated with uh, charge and fermionic quasi-particles, I believe. And on the left side, uh, the not insulator set of phenomena. Um, and perhaps you'll say, I'm, I should be thinking, how can these mix together? But anyway, that's, that's not the way I'm going to look at them. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to list the properties of the standard BCS superconductor and compare it with the properties of the high TC superconductors. You'll see they're quite different. And then, and by picking out the differences, I'm going to see whether we can make a theory that explains that phenomenology. So, um, so the origin of pairing in most BCS superconductors is the interaction with phonons, this blue dashed line. Uh, whereby an upspin at some point in the Fermi surface and a downspin at the opposite side of the Fermi surface interact and pair up. And this is the sort of BCS formula that they originally worked out. So, um, so it's known. In most cases, this is known. Uh, the energy gap in the BCS superconductor is S wave. That is, it has no node as we go around the Fermi surface. It doesn't have to be a completely perfect shape, but it has no node. Now, the energy gap, uh, according to the BCS theory, has a particular ratio. That's the ratio of the energy gap uh, to K Boltzmann times the temperature, uh, which is also an energy. And 2 delta over K TC is 3.5. Now, that is not exactly obeyed by experiments, but it's pretty hard to get anything above, let's say, 4.5 or below 3, let's say. So it's pretty narrowly bracketed by experiment. So that universal ratio actually holds. Um, and another uh, universal ratio, which is not perfectly obeyed, is the isotope shift, which is defined as the fractional shift transition temperature if I change the isotope mass to the fractional change in the isotope mass. And this is uh, 0.5. Where does that come from? 
if you look here, you'll see there's nothing here to do with uh, phonons, actually. Uh, nothing to do with phonon mass. Whereas here, you've got the phonon frequency, which goes like the square root of mass. So what you're seeing here is this prefect. This is none other than just the, the frequency dependence of the mass in that prefect. Nothing mysterious about it. Uh, now, the fifth thing is there's no ancillary phase transition associated with PCS. Normally, that's it. That's the phase transition at low temperatures, just superconductivity. Now, if we look at uh, the high TC materials, we see a very different story. Uh, the origin of pairing is in dispute. Uh, the energy gap is not S wave, it's D wave. So you have a plus lobe here, this is idealized, uh, minus lobe here, and nodes uh, like that. Uh, so that's very dramatically different. Uh, the, uh, so the energy gap is called D wave. Uh, the gap to TC ratio can go up to 10. Uh, this is my colleague Chang Sui's uh, data. And uh, you see it's going up to uh, 10 to 12 here uh, as, a fun, as the TC increases. So what you're seeing is the gap to TC ratio is not universal. It decreases the TC. Uh, and this is some uh, German work uh, which shows the same thing. Uh, so that's uh, pretty weird. So, so two things that are pretty, uh, well, we have to come to the isotope sheet. Do that. Um, so, so this is some data that started becoming available about 2000. And really, a, a lot of the really good data in high temperature superconductivity didn't start coming out till about 2000, mainly because the material science was so different. So this is New Zealand data, uh, a lot of this. And what you see here is the transition temperature having maximum at a particular doping, typically about 50%, and then the isotope shift having a deep minimum. But it's also very high here. It's above BCS. This is BCS. So when you look at this, you have to say, well, something pretty weird is going on. I mean, you can't really say it's not, uh, has no isotope shift. It's true that if you look there, it has a very, very low isotope. But if you look up here, it has a high isotope shift. So I think something weird is going on would be the right uh, way of looking at this data. Um, so two universal things, the isotope shift and the gap to TC ratio, two textbook things, just don't add up here. And what is equally dramatic is that there's an ancillary phase transition. Uh, occurring, uh, called the pseudo-gap phase transition. So here's the phase diagram sketched uh, by yours truly. Uh, this is again doping. So here again is the TC maximum, the red curve. Uh, this is the D-wave order. This is the isotope shift sketched here with this green line. And then this is the phase boundary of the pseudo gap. Below here, there's a pseudo gap, and above here is no pseudo gap. And actually, TVR is going to be talking about this region and the Nernst coefficient there. Um, OK. So, so how do you get this phase boundary? Well, there are actually a zillion ways. There's a, a famous review, a review on it. You can easily look that up. Um, and uh, one way is to look at the Nernst effect. And uh, it turns out to have a directionality below this phase boundary. And the symmetry is C4. That is to say, like a square, above the phase boundary. And below the phase boundary, it's C2. That is to say, it's like a rectangle. 
So that uh, square symmetry of the CuO2 plane is broken by this phase transition. So what exactly is going on? Well, although we have a zillion of these things, and by the way, the pseudo gap means that the density of states, instead of having uh, the density of states, instead of sort of you know, just being like that versus energy, has some sort of sort of dip at the Fermi level. So it's a pseudo gap. It's not a full gap, but it's something that shows up in all the data. So what's going on? Well, you have to do an experiment. And there's three or four experiments that tell us about this. And this is just one. So this is a, a extremely high resolution, stable uh, STM, scanning tunneling microscope picture of the CuO2 plane. So you see the crosses of the copper. Um, and the other things are the oxygen these black and white things. And uh, the difference between the color, black and white, is to do with uh, the tunneling current. Does it tunnel mostly below the Fermi level or mostly above the Fermi level? I won't go into that. So what you notice is the C4 symmetry is broken. These uh, black things are different from these white things. And uh, since these are the oxygens, it tells you that something's happening to the oxygens, uh, among other things. And if you look here, this is a little picture I made. What I'm saying is these oxygens have acquired a high vibration magnitude, and these oxygens have acquired a low vibration magnitude. Um, that's a qualitative statement. OK, that seems clear. And I think this is borne out by all kinds of fancy x-ray experiments and other things. We might go into. Okay. Um, so the symmetry breaking, and the symmetry breaking, interestingly, is local, uh, has a very, very short correlation length. Like over here, the phase of the symmetry breaking is switched. Just to, few letter spaces away. It's got a short correlation length, except in this particular one, where the, the symmetry is pegged to a structural feature in this crystal. That's why they did the experiment on that one. OK. So where does this lead us then? We've got some data. What are we going to deduce from it? Uh, well, there's a strongly felt view that this is spin-based, uh, but I have been showing you a lot of data that doesn't have too much to do with spin, actually. So I think the evidence shows that it can't be only spin. There is, I think in all superconductors, to a certain extent, there is a purely electronic component. Um, that's actually in the standard theory. Um, but, uh, but here, I think it probably is even a bit more so I think we're looking at probably a two-component pairing uh, situation. Um, so, the, so I believe we have to take into account three basic phenomena in order to um, explain this phenomenology. So one is oxygen buckling. So we saw in the previous foil how the oxygens were going a little crazy. Uh, the Van Hove singularity of the density of states. This is really old, like 1930s. And uh, coupling between these two is what uh, will do it in this approach. So let's look a bit at oxygen buckle. Now, actually, in recent years, there's been some superb work done in this field, uh, not on high TCs, but on uh, cubic perovskites. So here's what a cubic perovskite looks like. It has like a transition metal atom in the middle of the cube. It could be copper or nickel, for example. Oxygen here, for example. And uh, th this is called the A atom, which could be a rare earth, for example. And so if I go to the next cell, you'll see the perovskite bond. Like it could be copper, oxygen, copper. 
So now, uh, in these materials, many, many, many years ago, before this excellent paper, uh, it was pointed out that there's a thing called the T factor, the tolerance factor, which is the um, sort of theoretical uh, AO distance between the green and the red sphere, which you'd look up in a book, what the radii are. And the uh, BO distance, um, the, the bond value uh, with a root two. And essentially, if T is uh, greater than one or less than one, uh, the bond, the perovskite bond, is under compression or uh, stretching. Now, that's what the T factor tells you. And so now imagine that the bond is stretched. Uh, then what tends to happen? is the oxygen doesn't really know whether it wants to be close to this uh, B atom or this B atom. And so you form a double well uh, in the oxygen potential. And then you get ferroelectrons, or your piezoelectrics, ferroelectrics. Huge class of very, very important materials uh, used in medical devices, for example. Uh, in fact, uh, a short advertising book appropriate a recent paper of mine in Applied Physics Letters, uh, which claims to explain quantitatively uh, the property of a class, a, a new class of these ferroelectrons, piezoelectrons, too, which are very important for medical devices. Um, so, uh, so what's happening? Not that. If T is less than one, you get bond compression. And when you get bond compression, it means the oxygen buckles out of the bond like this. And this is the class of materials we're going to be interested in. Um, and then you get a double well in the potential. So uh, let's move on and look a little more at this. Now, these are the simplest pictures I could find in that paper. Um, this is absolutely stellar work uh, by a Korean lady called uh, E.J. Moon. Uh, it's in Nature Communication last year. So what is all this about? So it's really very simple. Uh, and uh, I know uh, HKR here uh, would immediately appreciate this, this stuff. Um, so it's a manganese oxide, one of the things you've worked on. Um, and the idea is you change A. A could be lanthanum, uh, which is big, or europium, which is small. And in that way, you change the T uh, factor. So here's a, here's a chunk of this. Uh, this so that what, what they've made is a, is a sample uh, of epitaxial layered structure. So here you have europium, here you have lanthanum, here you have europium, and so on. And this is all very high quality stuff. So, um, so, so here's what the uh, oxygen buckling angle is. Uh, so so the, the, just an angle like this, that's the oxygen buckling angle. And, and so it, it varies systematically as you go uh, along the axis of the sample, this axis. Okay, now let's look at the magnetism in a similar sample. Uh, so what, what we're seeing here is the magnetic moment at three temperatures. So let's just look at the lowest temperature, the blue one. And wow, uh, the, the magnetic moment is totally tracked by the oxygen buckling angle. Uh, in other words, we can actually, we can actually turn on and off electron, electronic phenomena with the oxygen buckling angle. Uh, that's the bottom line. And their model is that the electronic bandwidth goes like the cost of the deviation of the bond from linearity. It's an even function. 
So in other words, if I took three bonds like this, then I'd have, uh, these would be the same. These would be uh, undetermined. Undetermined. W dot. Would be these would have W less than W dot. W less than W dot. So in other words, the electrons can't get through the bond if the oxygen is off anchor. That's basically what it's telling you. That alters the exchange. And when the exchange is reduced, uh, the magnetism disappears. What vibrational mode? Yeah, well, it's a transverse vibrational mode of the oxygen to the bond. What energy does it have? What is the symbol representing? Yeah, the whole octahedra in the simplest picture, the octahedron rocks if all the bonds were, were behaving collectively. But that I don't think actually happens. So it's an oversimplification. Um, so now let's look at the high TCs, and we'll see this phenomenon uh, is present there also. Uh, so this is the LTT structure of the high TC material uh, LCO, the original one. And look, there are the buckled oxygens. And these are also buckled, but, uh, but the structure is rotated by 90 degrees around the z-axis. Um, so there's your buckling. And we, we predicted this in an ab initio calculation. This was not done by me. It was done by experts. Uh, and we also. Uh, in this calculation on this system. And uh, this was an incredibly tedious calculation. He set up different uh, substitution, isotope substitution, different uh, metal substitutions here, and created all these different dopings. Each one is a separate uh, type of crystal. And what you see is extremely interesting. The potential energy of the oxygen varies systematically as we change the doping. And in fact, uh, on the underdoped side, um, which is here, there is a, a double well situation. And on the uh, doped side, there's a signal well. So it transitions as you change the doping. So that, uh, that sort of concludes. Uh, optimum, yes, possibly, yes, that may well be. That may well be right. Of course, it's all in the numerical code, so you can't ask. So that uh, sort of establishes the idea of what is the buckle. Now we come to the uh, band structure. So this is the band structure of two of these materials. And I want to point out these two red spots, uh, which are actually saddle points. In other words, the band structure goes down here and up in the transverse direction. And when you have a saddle point in a two-dimensional band structure, Van Hove showed in the 30s, you get a log singularity in the next few steps. And in the Brewer zone, it looks like this. There are two Van Hoves, a Y and an X, but that will turn out to be extremely important. So that's really all you need to know about that. Uh, and now we come to the coupling. So the coupling is... Uh, Described here by the Eli Ashberg equation, which I'm not really going to go into, uh, you're looking at the uh, Z factor of the electrons. Um, 
and you're looking at the gap, the energy gap function, uh, which is a function of K and my super frequency of R. And they obey two equations where the inter-electronic interaction is eternal. There's a Green's function here. And otherwise, uh, it's an equation which, in general, is not linear, because the gap and the Z appear in the Green's function. So in general, it's a nonlinear equation, um, a nonlinear pair of equations. And it's a really great equation. It describes uh, pretty much quantitatively the super frequency. Um, so that the interaction consists of an electron photon piece in general. This is just a rather general slide. And an electronic interaction piece. Uh, so, um, so D of Q is the phononic propagator. These are the phononic couplings here. And this is the uh, Coulomb interaction. Uh, so now, when is it D-wave? It's D-wave when, uh, in real space, the pairing interaction is on a bond. Now, what we have here is um, we're going to be looking at uh, copper, oxygen, copper. And this is going to be vibrating like that. That's the mode we're looking at. And this is on a bond. So when you uh, do a Fourier transform to put it in K space, you get a cosine. And then that cosine uh, gives you a side change as you go from here to here in the Brewaza. Uh, and that's what leads to D-wave. Uh, that's been understood for a long time. So RVB, for example, has this problem because the exchange is on a bond. Uh, so um, that's fine. And in, in, a, in a simple model of D of Q, if it's just a charge-charge coupling, then the charge-charge coupling Fourier transform typically um, you know, follows like a, some sort of Fabian Thomas interaction, something like this as a function of Q. And that's a positive pulsation. And uh, that's, uh, that's counter D-wave because it's more repulsive here than it is there. So, uh, so actually, you could be fighting the Coulomb cool interaction when you're doing this in the in charge space, not in spin space. Okay, so suppose I just run uh, a really simple 20 line Eli Ashberg code um, and I do it with Van Hove's there and I do it with a, a, an interaction that's on a bond. So I get a D wave order parameter just like in the experiment of chemical potential. And look at the isotope check. If the frequency of the phonon is low, I get this extraordinarily low isotope check. I've taken an extremely extreme set of parameters, so this is just flat for a long space. But you could equally well get something more like this, more, more moderate. So the fact that you get an extremely deep dip in the isotope check is actually characteristic, or one thing it's characteristic of is electron phonon interaction with a low frequency phonon and a Van Hove singularity in the density of states. That's all that went into this very, very simple code. So now we're going to uh, proceed to a somewhat higher level of theoretical sophistication, but not very high. Um, so the model then is that electrons interact locally with buckets. That is this thing here. Uh, because of the Van Hove singularity, there's going to be a piles instability calling, causing a pseudo gap. And the electron-electron coupling to low, low frequency modes leads to high temperature superconductivity. So that, that's the sort of scenario. Um, and it's pretty hopeless in a lecture to sort of go through the math, so I'll, I'll try to make things as understandable as possible. So let's look at, look at a simple, a, a simple single perovskite bond, just like this. U is the, is the coordinate of the oxygen, the transverse to the bond. Right. So now the electronic energy level 
elements of a single bond look like this, as an antibonding level and a bonding level. Let's introduce a quantity called Q, which is related uh, to uh, the creation operator of this side minus the creation op operator of that side, multiplied by the destruction operator of this side minus the destruction operator of that side. And this beast is actually the number of electrons in that antibonding orbital. Now, if you put electrons in an antibonding orbital, you weaken a bond, ask any chemist, like me. Um, so therefore, what we expect is something like this picture. Uh, if, I, if Q is naught, if there are no electrons in the antibonding orbital, I have uh, a potential energy as a function of U, which either has sort of shallow double minima or no double minima at all. I increase Q somewhat to the average value. I get a deeper pair of double minima. I take Q as one, that's a whole electron in there. The bond is half broken. I've got two electrons in the bonding orbital, one in the anti-bonding orbital. That's a half broken bond. It has a deep double minima. So the potential energy curve of the oxygen is strongly coupled to uh, the number of electrons in the antibonding orbital. And so we have this model here. Uh, a positive, uh, uh, a uh, OK, well, we could have a positive here. So we have a u squared term. We have a positive u to the fourth term, which keeps the whole thing contained. And then we have a negative u squared term, which depends on q, the occupation of electrons in the antibody orbital, with a coupling b. So that's a very simple model describing this kind of PE surface uh, in this kind of situation. So we uh, generalized that to um, this model, which is called by us the fluctuating bond model. So it has a band here. For every bond, there's an oscillator, namely this oscillator here. And it has a, a kinetic energy, a harmonic term, and a fourth order term. And then there's this coupling, the vibrational coordinate squared times the number of electrons in the antibody orbital. Uh, and that, that's linked to this type of model. And to this effect. So using these calculations, we estimated the strength of this coupling. And it's not very strong at first, you see this. Uh, 214 material, that's the original material. The coupling strength is 0.14 volts. And for another material, a similar one, it's 0.1 volts. Um, and you can also have um, a coupling in fact, it should stay parallel. Oh, no, I see. This is, I see. OK, there are, these are all perpendicular to the bar, actually. So they're all of order 0.1 volts. Now, why would such a small energy have any effect? Well, the reason is that when you start taking Fourier coefficients of everything, you start finding that there are factors of 2, factors of 4, factors of 8 that start appearing. And in fact, this ends up as something near a volt actually, when it comes into the theory. No, it's just the math. Uh, so in other words, my definition has, has done it in such a way that it's rather a low value. So now let's look at how you get the pseudo gap. So, um, so what you do is you, uh, you take a, a mean field decoupling of this Hamiltonian. So for example, suppose I take uh, an expectation value of the electrons. Of the number of electrons in the antibody orbital. So then I'm gonna I'm gonna get a Hamiltonian with an effective uh, potential for the oscillator, 
And so I can use that, I can solve that uh, potential with a little matrix and uh, get out all the eigenvalues and eigenstates. Uh, now the other thing I can do is I can take uh, the expectation value of the square of the vibrational amplitude, that's this thing, and we saw the experiment could see something happening there. And uh, what we get uh, is then a Hamiltonian in which the, uh, this thing is multiplied by the square of the vibrational amplitude. Now, if we just go back one, uh, look at this. This is this uh, number of electrons in the antibody normal. If you look carefully, you'll see that it contains a hopping term. C2 dagger C1, C1 dagger C2. So what you've got here is something whereby the vibrational amplitude is controlling the hopping here T between copper atoms. Uh, so it's simply telling us that the bigger the vibrational amplitude of the oxygen, the harder it is to get from one copper to another. So it's very simple. So the, the physics of this is very simple. And what happens is, if I, uh, if I, if I run this model self-consistent, uh, what I get is I find that uh, there's a phase boundary. And uh, on one side of the phase boundary, the, uh, the vibrational amplitude of the oxygen and the X and Y bonds are the same. And on the other side of the phase boundary, the, the value of where the vibrational amplitude is different between the X and Y bonds. In other words, I find a C4 to C2 split. Um, and I, I could use the coupling values that I got from the ab initio calculation. Now, before I go very much further, and I, in fact, I'm almost done, um, we've got to uh, self-consistent uh, work out the potential to use. So the way this is done is using the RPA, or a variant of the RPA, um, also called quasi-harmonic approximation. It's the thing everybody uses. I keep rediscovering it. In fact, PRL appeared about a year or two ago, announcing their rediscovery or their discovery of quasi-harmonic approximation. So what you do is you basically sum these diagrams for the oscillator get an effective oscillator propagator. You then put this with the Coulomb interaction, form an effective Coulomb interaction. And then you take the effective Coulomb interaction and you put it into the RPA. So uh, the prescription is quite clear. So when we do this, what do we get? So here is the pseudo gap. And actually, you may wonder about these little bumps, but I tracked them down as to where the, the slight sort of numerical difference. Um, so, um, what have we got here? This is the pseudo gap. It's a function of dopa. And what you see is these are different uh, temperatures. So, you see the pseudo gap uh, gets weaker and weaker. Sorry, these are the actual values of the pseudo gap in millivolts. So what you're actually seeing is as you uh, raise the temperature, this is temperature, the pseudo gap gets weaker and weaker and weaker, and then you have the phase boundary and the pseudo gap ceases to exist. So this is exactly what the data shows. And as a matter of fact, these values are pretty good uh, relative to the data. So it's a fairly realistic calculation. Um, now, what's happening in the pseudo gap? You, you just won't believe this. Sort of, you know, idiot chemist uh, has got this wrong. Um, the, the oxygen split, the density of states on one oxygen, uh, so we've got two kinds of oxygens. So the density of states on one of those oxygens 
looks like this red curve and the other one like the purple curve. So they split. So, you're, so experts will recognize a Pyle's distortion here. That's the carbon cell. So there's a split in the density of states associated with something happening in the lattice, a symmetry breaking in the lattice. So that's what's happening. And this is a very powerful effect because you've got two spikes in the density of states from a split. And all, all the density of states on one oxygen goes down, and all the density of states on the other oxygen goes up. It's hard to believe. Um, so, so what do we get then? Uh, so now we can go to the superconductivity. We go through the RPA, we calculate the potential, we run the Eli Ashford equation. Uh, this was all done by a um, student from Taiwan. Jianhao Xiao. And this is what you get for the uh, TC. It looks actually quite realistic. Uh, these are the gaps. Uh, here's an amplified version of it. It's D waves, basically. Uh, now, the story that is not quite so good is the isotope shift. Uh, it has a minimum, but it, despite us sort of cooking the graph as much as we could, uh, it doesn't go below 0.15. Um, so that's a disagreement. Um, what about the gap to TC ratio? Yes, it goes from uh, 3 up to 6 over this fairly narrow range of TC, but this is good. So actually, we've got a large part of this phenomenology, the D wave, the anomalous gap to TC ratio, the pseudo gap, a dip in the isotope shift that's not entirely satisfactory. So uh, can we do anything about that? You know, we look at the calculation, where does it come from? Well, unfortunately, it turns out that the Quasar harmonic approximation has a flaw in that it, it calculates an effective frequency of the vibrator. And that effective frequency includes the mass in it. And this is really not correct. Uh, it's, a, it's an artifact of the uh, uh, quasar harmonic approximation. Uh, so when I come to look at these uh, various points, now, the next step is to go beyond the quasar harmonic approach. So I'm working on that now. Actually, there's a born oppenheimer approach, which uh, seems to be clean and does not have the mass artifact. Uh, so that should give the very low uh, isotope shift that we expect. So one more little point. This is the uh, believed structure of the new H3S superconductor. 200 K TC and 190 GPA. And uh, a recent Nature paper does some excellent theoretical work on it, of course, using the quasi harmonic approximation. And um, it's very nonlinear primaries. And what they believe is the cause of the pairing is it has like a perovskite bond visiting it. Uh, it's actually the hydrogen vibration along the bond which they believe is the cause of this superconductivity. So with that, uh, I'll thank you and uh, end my talk. Do we have time for a few questions? Uh, Sumanan? So you're concerned that the single particle picture may not be accurate. And that, you know, it, it isn't 100% accurate. And, uh, you know, eventually it would be a good idea to, to do a more quantitative theory, which included, let's say, self-energy corrections, uh, which would take that into account. Others? Uh, in uh, your results slide, uh, the superconducting dome had a dip. Uh, what causes that dip exactly? Yeah, that dip is present in the uh, YBCO material, otherwise known as the 1, 2, 3 material. 
but it's not present in the others. And I believe the cause of that uh, is essentially that in the uh, YBCO material, there, there are chains which define a particular direction. And that is actually why the Nernst experiment yielded a, a good result, because there's something to organize the C2 order parameter to lock it in place. Um, now, when you have that happening, uh, it creates a split in the Van Hoves, uh, an intrinsic split in the Van Hoves, which is probably the cause of that uh, double harm. Ultimately. I have one more question. Uh, this Maybe you can continue later. Uh, Tanmay? Um, so people also use that the nesting between the van of singularity also causes the charge order. And charge order has a much lower temperature and also the different phase diagram than the pseudo gap. You're so, talking about in the height is uh, charge order transition? Yeah. Probably you're talking about the LCO material or LBR. Now they are seeing in all the materials, YBCO, LSCO, BISCO. And the fact that if you gap out your band of singularity region by your pseudo gap with your bond order, then there is no quasi particle. So that doesn't lead to any. A little bit of quasi. It's not a complete gap. It's a little bit of quasi particle. So I, I, I think it's quite possible for it to cause all kinds of transitions. Yeah. So, I mean, once you have already an order that is set by the van of singularity. Yeah, and that there shouldn't be another one. You say there shouldn't be another one. And what that would be, will that be twice. charge order? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. But that's a good question. I'll go check it out. Yeah. Um, um, if I if I understood you correctly, you said that the temperature at which the C4 to C2 transition takes place and also be identified with the T star that is obtained from Nernst uh, effect measurements. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to understand how that comes about in your theory. I mean, so, so uh, what exactly is happening to the superconductivity in your theory, which would give you something like the effect of a T star? I mean, how do I see that there's going to be a decrease in the Nernst signal at T star coming from an effect like this, so that above T star it essentially becomes unmeasurable? Well, I'm not an expert on the Nernst effect. You've got the, you should go to the original speaker of this morning. Sorry? But, uh, but I mean, what you're seeing here is that, uh, this theory, what you're seeing is it's basically this splitting. It's it's just piles distortion. So uh, so the it's usually you know you think of a piles distortion as being like one atom moving this way and one atom moving that way, but in this case it's a second order effect. So it's like one has a large vibrational amplitude and the other a small one. And when that happens, it splits this uh, Van Hoff singularity like that. And it follows just from the very simplest of the equations I've shown. You can see that. Um, so, the, so it's just a piles effect. It's not intrinsically got anything to do with the superconductivity. Uh, a lot of the time, the pseudo gap phase boundary is you know, way above the superconductivity phase transition, but part of the time they do merge. Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, the last question. Uh, so the uh, so one view of high TC could be that, you know, the normal phase itself is actually pretty fuzzy. There's a lot of puzzles associated with that. For example, uh, the place where you show the isotope effect to have the least, uh, or, or, or this, to have the least effect, you will see in the experiment that the normal state is very anomalous. It has no quasi particle. It's very non Fermi liquid, right? So where does, does that is that captured in your theory? Well, that's fifteen percent. Yeah. Uh, Just about there, the normal state is actually pretty, pretty strange, right? I mean, it's a strange metal. Well, it's somewhat strange, but I did show this one. I think there's a degree of subjectivity, probably, as to exactly what you see in the data. 
well, this is really to do with this thing. So yeah, I agree the 15, this dashed line, which is the bot transition. So for example here, but I mean here, if you look at the Fermi velocity, you know, it's very, very much higher than here. So it's sort of like a glass half full, a glass half empty, you know, I mean, I, this really is, there obviously are a lot of residual many, I mean, somehow, even though there are only a few percent changes in this dome, there are huge changes in the nature of the system as you, as you go along here. So we are really well away from the bot transition of 15%, I would say. Have, okay, have you looked at the, the, the spectral function of the electron at high temperatures above your TC at, uh, say, 0. 0.15 and look for the fact that it's, a, it's, not, a non, it's not a Fermi liquid? Well, I'm, I'm not too sure about, the, about that data. Um, you see, for example, this stuff has largely died out in this region. Uh, this is this anomalous neutron uh, correlation effect between the spins. So, um, you know, if you could give me a reference, I'll look it up and uh, we can talk about it at the meeting. That'll be very valuable. So, in fact, to anybody who wants to continue their questions. You know, I'm here for the week, and I'd really appreciate uh, the chance to uh, to learn more about more data or you know, more theory. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank Dr. Nunes again. And uh, we have a coffee break for uh, half hour, right? Yeah. So we will, uh, we will, we will